All right. Here we are, 403. And welcome everybody to the Landmark Ideas series. Uh, this is uh, Ken Mandel, um, the, the director of the Computational Health Informatics Program at Boston Children's Hospital. And we're very pleased to be able to host this series where we hear from singular thinkers uh, about their ideas. Um, past um, speakers have included um, uh, uh, David Clark, a um, inventor of TCP IP and the internet, uh, Maxine McIntosh, um, who talked to us about um, oversight boards for social media companies, a topic that was uh, presented to us more than a year ago, but was quite prescient in its relevance. Um, Ricky Bloomfield, who's the head of um, uh, health uh, at Apple. Nick Christakis, one of the great thinkers uh, around society and network science. Um, and uh, we have many uh, speakers coming up, which I'll talk about at the end. Today, um, it is my great pleasure um, to introduce um, a uh, friend and colleague um, at Harvard, uh, Lawrence Lessig, uh, who really needs no introduction. Um, and he's gonna talk today about the privacy confusion, first thoughts on clearer thinking. So um, he summarizes where we're going today by saying privacy has become a central focus of policy debate in every context. In this talk, Lessig argues that we're conceiving of the problem in a fundamentally flawed way. Offered is a different framework, radically different, but critically better, or so it is hoped. I'll say a word or two about Professor Lessig who is the Roy Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School. He previously taught at Stanford, where he founded the Center for Internet and Society and at the University of Chicago. Um, I will mention um, uh, two of my favorite items from his CV. He uh, is a founding board member of the Creative Commons, an incredibly uh, important and widely used alternative to copyright that many of us uh, enjoy as a way to share our intellectual work. And he's a founder of the, um, uh, of the uh, free, uh, uh, he's a founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation as well. Um, today, um, I am just looking forward to hearing um, a, a reimagining um, of, of our privacy construct at a time when privacy could not be more central to the public debate. And with that, we'll turn it over to Professor Lessig. Thanks, Ken. It's, it's great to be here. And um, I, uh, I'm grateful for that introduction. I just need to make one slight correction because I don't want to get into trouble. I was a board member of the EFF, but I wasn't um, uh, oh, okay. prescient enough to, be, to create that organization many years ago. Um, it, but it's an incredibly important organization today. Um, so I, as you know, I prepared a, uh, I, I put together this talk and then I realized that technology was not gonna make it easy to present it. Um, so I decided to record it as a presentation. So I'm gonna sit here and watch it, which is gonna be difficult for myself, um, maybe difficult for you too, but, um, and then I'm happy to take questions on it at the end. So let me just launch the presentation in the, um, in the shared window, and then um, I look forward to your questions afterwards. And first thoughts on clearer thinking. In the 2000s, in the internet space, there was an extraordinary set of copyright wars, triggered by technologies like Napster and BitTorrent and LimeWire, technologies that enabled the easy sharing of copyrighted material. Organizations like the RIAA went into some hysterics in response to the technology. And that's because copies of copyrighted work, typically MP3s, were being distributed, multiplied, spread across the internet without any care to compensate the copyright owner. And the strategy of these associations was to deploy techniques to control the copies. 
Now they relied on the law to achieve this, but increasingly they saw the more effective technique for them would be to use digital rights management technology, DRM. And what DRM would do would be to enable the control of the distribution of the digital copy. So there was an explosion of technologies, many different technologies, to enable the control of these, quote, copies. And the most prominent and successful of these technologies is produced by a company called Content ID, which is now paired with YouTube so that every single file uploaded to YouTube is immediately scanned for any indication of copyrighted music in that video. Now, in my view, my humble opinion, this strategy was a mistake. Yes, of course, artists needed to be compensated, but the unintended consequence of this particular way of assuring compensation was an extraordinary interference with the opportunity of copyrighted material to be produced and shared and created by other creators. Increasingly, YouTube began to spread this image as material which was to be shared across YouTube was blocked by the deployment of these technologies, these massively efficient technologies to scan and block copyrighted material, producing all sorts of absurd con consequences. Here's one favorite example. This is a man, Paul Davids, whose profession is to teach people how to play the guitar. He had used the internet, YouTube, to enable that teaching, and yet he found himself against the control of... This video, for example, in this video about licks, I'm playing a tiny lick of an eagle song. Just one lick. I'm not playing the last note. And now this video is completely blocked for viewers in the United States, where coincidentally my biggest public is. And all the advertised money the video is making from the rest of the world goes to them. Everything. Not one cent for me. So for a two second lick, eight little notes. Da -da 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 in a freaking 15 minute long video doesn't matter the rest of the video doesn't matter so the stories of youtube takedowns are plentiful and we see all sorts of channels of creators producing work which is not really a violation of copyrighted material finding their work blocked because of the efficiency or crude efficiency of this technology now i could go on for ages about the ways in which traditional copyright law have conflicted with the technologies of the internet. But the question I wanna focus on briefly now is how could we have done things differently? How could we have done things better? And my view is we would have done something better if we didn't try to regulate the distribution of quote unquote copies, but instead if we had tried to regulate uses, the uses of creative work. And these uses are different, and whether they should be taxed, meaning regulated under copyright, depends on the character of the use. So if we think about the potential uses of copyrighted works, we can imagine copying a work, taking a whole song, making a duplication of that song. We could imagine remixing that work, putting it into your own creativity or using it as an example in uh, a lesson. And then we can think about people doing it for commercial purposes or people doing it for non-commercial purposes, where commercial trades on the idea that this is a business that's profiting off of the use, and non-commercial means any other use which is not primarily directed towards the profit interest. And these two dimensions intersect in importantly different ways. So a commercial use which just simply copied other people's creativity should be directly and strongly regulated by copyright law. But a non-commercial remix, where a kid takes some music and integrates it into a video they're doing to demonstrate something about their latest play in Fortnite, should be free of copyright regulation. And this view would think that between these two extremes, there are some gray or red and green cases, cases where there's an argument for some regulation, some compensation, but an argument as well for important freedom. So the ability to remix and to reinterpret what a cover is in the context of music. Even though commercial would be relatively free, some compensation would have to be paid, but the owner couldn't control it. And the same thing with distributing copies in a non-commercial way to friends or to family.
could be controlled in some minimal way, but not perfectly controlled the way a commercial distribution of copies would. So regulated here would mean compensated, and compensated uses then would assure the artist would be paid. Now, the key to this is that this strategy ignores the thing, the copy, and instead focuses on the use. <clears throat> okay, 20 years later, we're no longer in the middle of the copyright wars. We're in the middle of something we could call the privacy wars. Explosion of technologies from companies like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Google have led consumers to begin to be terrified about how their data is being used. These consumers um, are terrified because we have an internet driven by a business model, and the business model of the internet is increasingly a model of advertising. Now, this is relatively new. When the framers, the founders of Google, originally talked about uh, what their platform would be, Larry Page and Sergey Brin famously wrote, advertising funded search engines will be inherently biased towards the advertisers and away from the needs of the consumer. But then their advisors advised them that they wouldn't make much money if they didn't find a way to advertise. So they quickly effectively reformed their view but then unfunded search engines will be biased against Google's investors. That's my interpolation of what they must have thought. They didn't say that out loud. And so never mind, advertising would be part of what Google would do. So this bias was then embraced in the context of Google search engine. And to embrace it, they depended upon data. And the key here is that the data is made. It's not just found. It's not just the passive act of collecting data, the way this webcam at Hamptons.com sits there and simply captures images of cars as they drive by. This data, these data are actively produced by poking or tweaking or asking questions, by watching everything users do as they do things on the internet and by getting them to do more, by rendering us vulnerable, by reaching down what we could think of as the emotional brain stack and leveraging our insecurity so that we produce more. This is the business model of Facebook and Instagram as they constantly show us the happy lives others have, inducing us to engage more effectively with their platforms to demonstrate that we too have happy lives. So we do more because of these inducements and therefore we reveal more so that they then see more so that they can sell better ads. Now this business model has been referred to as surveillance capitalism. It's a capitalism that depends on the surveillance of the use. And in her extraordinary book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, Shoshana Zuboff catalogs the extraordinary rise of this business model and the technologies that make that possible. Now, my view is this book is a brilliant understanding and it fully justifies the panic that we see consumers demonstrating. And it also accounts for the resistance that has developed in response to this technology. And we can see that this resistance is growing. It's growing in the context of regulation. The GDPR, the EU's effort to control and protect privacy, is the most important global regulation or effectively global regulation of privacy. In the United States, through a referendum, California adopted a Privacy Act, which has uh, equally controlling and effective uh, GDPR-like restrictions to protect privacy. And some companies like Apple have begun to be leaders in the press for a platform of technology that respects privacy. This is Tim Cook, this. A little more than two years ago, I spoke in Brussels about the emergence of a data industrial complex. As I've said before, if we accept as normal and unavoidable that everything in our lives can be aggregated and sold, then we lose so much more than data. We lose the freedom to be human. Real issue. Earlier today, we released a new paper called A Day in the Life of Your Data. It tells the story of how apps that we use every day contain an average of six trackers. 
This code often exists to surveil and identify users across apps watching and recording their behavior. Right now, users may not know whether the apps they use to pass the time, to check in with their friends, or to find a place to eat may in fact be passing on information about the photos they've taken, the people in their contact list, or location data that reflects where they eat, sleep, or pray. So this resistance has a form. And the form is to call for the regulation of data. Now you might see the parallel I'm attempting to draw here. Just like in the copyright wars, the form of the resistance by organizations like the RAAA was to regulate copies. In the context of privacy, the resistance is to call for efforts to regulate data. And the form of that regulation is based in two fundamental principles, that individuals are said to, quote, own their data. And second, that companies should only use that uh, owned data with the permission of the owner. Just like users of the internet should only copy created work, copyrighted work, with permission of the copyright owner. So these principles of resistance are principles of empowerment and choice, kind of the motherhood and apple pie of the modern policy spectrum. And no one could be against the idea of empowerment and choice. But in this talk, I want to give you a reason why I am against empowerment and choice. I'm against empowerment and choice, at least as the response we are adopting to the problem of privacy in the internet. Okay, so we can begin to sense what the problem with empowerment and choice is by looking at what empowerment and choice looks like. So everybody knows that every single app you inter, inter, uh, uh, interact with on the internet um, is an app that offers terms of service. And this wonderful website lists the terms of service for some of the major apps. But what it attempts to demonstrate in this graphic is the extraordinary length of these terms of service. The longest being Microsoft, which would take an hour and three minutes and 30 seconds to read. Indeed, all of the major services have terms of service which are essentially incomprehensible if only because of their length to the vast majority of people. And so the first question is, is, does anybody read these terms of service? But even more importantly, could they understand them? Could they understand the implications of them? Could they understand how they interact? Or could they understand what happens when one service is owned by another, where the privacy of Instagram interacts with the privacy of Facebook? Though we tell people what the rules are, we make a strong presumption that people understand or could understand or have the time to understand what those rules would mean. And then we require them to affirm that these are the rules they're willing to live with. Now, this is a general ph phenomenon. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with telling the truth. I would make it my rule, like obsessively, kind of in a weird way, to make sure that I went through the day never once lying. But we live in a time where we lie every single day. All of us do. How many times have you come to a site like this or a click box like this. Please indicate that you've read and agree to the terms of service and privacy policy. You always click this box, but you have never read those terms of service or privacy policy. You think it's completely okay to engage in that common life, living life through this lie. Now, my view is, and maybe that's because of my obsessive youth, that this is corrosive and corrupting of the normal way we interact, the ordinary integration of deception into our life is almost Soviet in its character. And it begins to bleed, I believe, into other areas of our life. And anyway, even if it were justified, my view is this way of protecting privacy is just ineffective for privacy. It is both too protective of privacy and not protective enough. So let's start with too protective. 
My friend Alex Pentland at MIT uh, wrote this extraordinary book, Social Physics, in 2014. And in that book in 2014, he described the incredible potential that's given to us from cell phones. So as he writes, mobile data shows that this is not true. People can reliably change their behaviors when they become ill. So we can watch what they do by watching the data from the mobile cell phone, and that data can begin to reveal whether the person is ill. With reported sore throat and cough symptoms, we found that people's normal patterns of socializations were disrupted, and they began to interact with more and different people, good for the virus, but bad for humans. And based on those data, Alex was able to conclude, it is possible to actually classify people's overall health state from their behavior alone. And here's the money quote. The ability to track diseases, such as the flu at the level of the individuals, would give us real protection against pandemics because we could take steps to reach infected people before they spread the disease further. So the point is this technology, which is providing this information to cell towers as you walk around using your cell phone, could provide the information necessary to begin to identify the source and spread of diseases such as pandemics. But the ability to do that depends upon the ability to access the data. And right now, as we've seen in this last pandemic, there's no presumptive access by even health authorities to these data. Um, uh, and so there was no easy ability to use these data to control the pandemic. It was not feasible to use these data because of concerns raised about, quote, privacy. So that's the sense in which it could be too protective. Because if we could use these data to stop a pandemic, my own view is we should be using the data to stop the pandemic. But then it's also not protective enough. So here's a hypothetical, which is suggested by a number of recent reports about the capacity of AI technologies to understand our mental condition from how we write. So imagine a technology that compared how you texted at two different periods. So for example, in 2009, you write a text, hey kid, great to see you on Saturday, let's get together next week, dad. And then 10 years later, you write the same text, hey kid, great to see you Saturday, let's get together next week, dad. But what the technology is able to do, let's imagine, and this is again based on technologies that are being developed, is to watch the way you write and from the differences, begin to infer whether you might have dementia or other mental conditions developing that ought to either be treated or at least signal your future health conditions. Now imagine these data were then turned over to insurance companies and those insurance companies then canceled your insurance policy or raised your rates based on these information because of their expectations of the increased cost. But the point is, it's hard to imagine how this is not violating privacy in the context of texts that you're sharing with your kid or Facebook posts that you might be sharing with your kid. Though, of course, Twitter can reveal publicly data that might be trackable in the same way. But the point of the recent work is to demonstrate that the same is true even with static texts. Comparing, for example, an academic's writing from younger days to current days, you begin to infer facts about the health, the mental health of the academic. And the point is these data are purely public. There's no privacy right to control access to these data when you publish an article in a journal, for example. Um, instead, the private fact here, the fact about your mental condition, is inferred from the public data, but privacy can't protect against that inference from the public data. So in this sense, I want to say privacy as it currently is focused is not, is not protective enough. So in both cases, my point is the same. A privacy policy focused at the level of data, like a copyright policy focused at the level of copies, is not actually an effective privacy policy. And instead, we should focus on privacy 
we should protect privacy by focusing not at the level of data, but at the level of use. And here I want to introduce a friend of mine, a colleague from Harvard, John Zittrain, who had this same insight in a paper he published when the what the publisher can teach the patient intellectual property and privacy in an era of trusted provocation. Who knows exactly what that word means, but it won't be important here. In this article, John uh, asserts, as I've asserted here, that copyright is essentially privacy when you think about the policy concerns and the strategies for responding. And he made this point, not this year, but 20 years ago in a paper published in the Stanford Law Review. And as he said, just as with copyright learning, it should focus on uses, maybe privacy too should learn by focusing us on uses. And uses here would be the different kinds of uses that could be made of our private data. So again, if we think about a matrix and we think about uses of my data that benefits the user versus uses of my data that harms the user, and then uses of the data that benefits society and uses of the data that harms society. The first box is to think of uses that benefit me and benefit society. My favorite example here is Amazon. Um, Amazon, which I've been a customer for for almost 20 years, actually more than 20 years, this is a new account I remember now, constantly looks at what I purchase and then recommends to me books I might want to pur purchase. And its recommendations are extremely good. It's using my private data in a way that I like because I learn what I want to actually buy. And it benefits society to the extent you think selling books is a good thing. So let's put Amazon in that first box. Benefits the user, benefits society. Then there are uses that harm the user, even if they benefit society. So imagine a technology that made it simple for us to identify predators on the internet predators who are preying on children. Obviously, the predators are not happy about the fact that the technology helps identify them, but society is pretty happy about the fact that we're able to identify them. The third case then we could focus on is a case where we can imagine uh, uh, benefiting, harming the user and harming society. So for example, Wired wrote a piece about these incredibly sad figures um, who are addicts on, uh, with digital technology. And what these addicts experience is a constant pull to play games or to spend money in these games because of the design and implementation of these games. Uh, and we can imagine that what's happening is that the data about these users is being used to feed their addiction. And if we believe that that's harming the user and harming society to have addicts uh, exploited in this way, what's called in the digital world, whales, these are the whales, then we, this is a classic case of harming the user and harming society. But the most interesting case is gonna be this box. Uses which presumptively benefit the user, the user wants them, but they harm society. Now to introduce this, I wanna introduce a parallel dynamic. Um, which similarly benefits the user, but we might think harms society. Think about what we could call body hacking. So I'm sure many of you have uh, seen this extraordinary book by Michael Moss, Salt, Sugar, Fat. This tells the story of the rise of food science. Food science meaning science devoted to engineering food to overcome our natural resistance to the consumption of that food, the perfect mix of salt, sugar, and fat to make it so it's almost impossible for many people at least to resist one more bite. So you know these familiar foods which are architected in a way to resist uh, our efforts to resist them by exploiting how our bodies have evolved in the 50,000 years of modern human existence. Call this body hacking. Exploiting evolution with the aim to sell food or we could say quote unquote food and for some people at least, of course, with tragic consequences, body hacking. Now, there's a parallel we could think about, let's call it brain hacking. It's a term um, that's uh, developed uh, in the context of um, work being done by a former Google engineer. Uh, and that Google engineer who started uh, a, a center 
called the Center for Humane Technology. His name is Tristan Harris. Tristan Harris's aim is to demonstrate that the design of digital technology is a science too. And increasingly, digital platform developers are engineering that technology so as to engineer the attention of the users of that technology. The aim is to overcome their resistance. And the resistance is obviously a resistance to uh, watching other things or consuming less. And here too, this technique is exploiting evolution. So we as humans have evolved such that we respond irrationally to random rewards, which is why slot machines are so effective. Or we humans have evolved to make it very hard for us to stop feeding from bottomless wells of content, which is why your Reddit feed goes on and on and on. These engineers, these digital engineers, engineer our experience with the aim to gather data about us with the objective to then sell ads. Now, that objective of selling ads is their primary purpose, but it has a secondary effect. So think about the Facebook news feed. The Facebook news feed has individual effects. It leads to addictions, it leads to depression. There's some research that suggests that it actually increases the prevalence of suicide, but I don't wanna focus on those effects. I wanna focus on the social effects because these platforms are architected to isolate us and therefore to make us vulnerable to extremism and to conspiracies that drive our attention in particular ways. As Zainab Tufetchi puts it, companies in the business of monetizing attention are in the business of monetizing attention and not necessarily in ways that are conducive to health or success of social movements or the public sphere. And that drives the politics of hate because it turns out that if they can fuel the politics of hate in the context of these news feeds, they can make more money from the attention that their users give to the news feeds. To the extent they can make us polarized and ignorant, that's the most profitable strategy for them as a platform. And so there's a certain externality to the social data here and that externality is an externality that taxes society to give the user what the user presumptively wants, namely access to the newsfeed, and also what the company wants because of the profit they make from the advertising. So this is an example of a use that benefits the user even if it harms the society. And that example is the hardest to imagine regulating because we like this use individually, but we collectively should hate the use because of its effect on society. Now you might stand back and say, well, why should we think of Facebook as responsible, for example, for the polarization which is driven from their newsfeed if people are voluntarily choosing to follow the newsfeed? Well, compare, imagine a bar and the question of the liability the bar might face for accidents caused by intoxicated customers who've left the bar and driven on the road and hit somebody with their car. When are they responsible? Well, we don't think a bar is responsible merely because it opens. Maybe it should be, but it's not in any jurisdiction in the United States. Merely because it's open doesn't mean it's responsible for the harm caused by its customers. We might be a little bit more concerned if it runs an extensive happy hour designed and intended to get people uh, intoxicated, especially if it's during uh, a rush hour time. Um, a rule that says no limit, where the bartender says, I'm gonna serve anybody who asks for what they uh, ask for a drink, regardless of the condition they're in. In most jurisdictions in the United States, if a bartender knowingly sells somebody a drink when they are intoxicated, they're then responsible for the harm caused when that person leaves the bar. But imagine a fourth case. Imagine a bartender who is also a pharmacologist and knows precisely how to spike the drinks so that it's hard for the customer to resist drinking more. You might think those are pretzels or popcorn, which they are in effect because salt has that effect, but it's more transparent to the user. You know you're gonna drink more if you eat the pretzels while drinking. But this effect is hidden. Nobody knows that this is what's happening. They don't even recognize that they're consuming more because of the spiking of the drinks. In that case, there's no doubt the bartender 
the bar should be responsible for the harm caused by their serving of alcohol. And the point here is to recognize the way Facebook is spiking the drinks. Facebook is tweaking what's fed to its audience for the purpose of triggering the audience even more powerfully. Now, not because they want to create chaos, but just because they want to sell ads. And just as you might say, the bartender isn't spiking the drinks because they want to kill people on the highway. Instead, they simply want to sell more drinks. So the point is, Facebook would be responsible, at least if we could show that the spiking was making democratic culture worse, rendering democracy vulnerable, re rendering democracy more polarized, at least for the purpose simply to sell ads. And this is the point where I often just have to pause and think to myself, I, it's hard to really believe this is what's happening in our world today. To see the effect that's being produced by these platforms, and then to think, for what end? Because if you told me you were destroying democracy for the purpose of ending climate change, I, I'd say I'm against it, but I understand the relationship between the objective and the means. Or if you told me you were destroying democracy to end world hunger, again, I'd be against it, but I would understand why we were pursuing these means given the importance of the end. But when we recognize that we're destroying a democracy to make certain platforms even richer, I just can't begin to understand why we have allowed this to occur, simply to sell ads. So this category suggests the problem that I think we need to think of privacy in a different way to solve. Because if we focus on these four different kinds of uses, I want to suggest that we should think about four different policy responses for these uses. The first box, benefits society, benefits users, should be presumptively free. The fourth box, harming user or harming society, should be presumptively banned. And in between, we see categories where it's more difficult to make a simple rule, but the guiding principles are clear. And those guiding principles should be guiding choices about what kinds of uses of data are permitted, not as a function of the choice of individuals, not as a function of the fact that there is data that is being distributed, but as a function of the use. Okay, so what might such a regime look like? Here are some first thoughts of how to regulate use. There are three principles here that we should think about together. One, we should focus on normal cases. Two, we should require audible, auditable practices. And three, we should assure adequate punishment for those who break the rules. So first, normal cases. If we think about a spectrum, of possible uses of private data. And we imagine some uses would always be okay. Aggregating data to report on the breakdown between men and women, the demographic breakdown of men and women using a particular site. And some uses that would never be okay. Reporting on my interaction with my children uh, to demonstrate my increasing mental dementia uh, to my insurance company. Um, and then some category of cases where it could be okay or not okay, and we would want the user to choose. This continuum begins to suggest whether this alternative to regulating privacy through regulating data could be any, uh, any better. So if there were very few cases that were never okay, and very few cases that were always okay, and most cases were cases we thought the user should choose, then there would be no difference with the existing regime. But if there are lots of cases where it was always okay, and lots of cases where it was never okay, and the number of use cases where the user should have to choose were relatively small, then this alternative regime would be very different, in my view, very much better, because it would allow us to focus on choices where it was important for us to choose and require the rest of them to be governed by principles that we have debated in an open democratic way as principles that should guide the use of data. So that's number one. Number two is to require auditable practices. So data practices must be audible, auditable, which means that uh, a government like the IRS could come in and see exactly how you're using data and data would be presented in a way that it was easy to track how it was used just as accounting standards make it relatively easy to, attract how, uh, uh, to track how 
money is flowing inside of a company. And third, there needs to be adequate punishment. Because the thing is, business models are designed on the basis of the expected return from certain practices. And if you make certain penalties large enough, um, then uh, the wrongful use would never produce a positive expected return. And we should expect that the rational corporation would then not follow the wrongful use because they know it would cost more than it would benefit them. Now, I re realize there's lots of reasons to be skeptical of this because we do a terrible job today in setting penalties high enough to induce companies not to engage in bad behavior. So drug companies are famously fined very small fines compared to the benefit that the wrongful behavior that they have engaged in uh, produces for them, so obviously not creating any proper incentives. But the difference between regulating drug companies and regulating here is that it's easier to regulate new practices than to regulate old practices. Because as we set the environment for this new world of, uh, of uh, surveillance capitalism, the opportunity to make it so that it's never rational to engage in wrongful data practices means that they mainly won't. Okay, what would we get? Why would we benefit from this alternative system of regulation? Well, my view is, just like I think there's great value from use of creative work in all sorts of contexts nobody controls or regulates, there's extraordinary potential from the massive spread of open data. Uh, we could learn an enormous amount about how to make our world better if we had better access to this extraordinary range of data. So from pandemics to energy efficiency to improving markets, whatever, if we could allow access to these data, then the capacity we're developing for analyzing and, and reacting is extraordinary and inc inc incredibly important. But if we could then protect privacy in this context, in this different way by regulating use, then we could realize these important benefits. Okay, one final thought as we stop. Um, you might have seen Facebook recently has been pushing back against Apple's effort to insist on higher privacy standards. They released this ad recently in response to Apple's threat to make it almost impossible for users of the iOS uh, device to be tracked without them knowing that they are tracked. People have ideas. Ideas are all around. You watch them, add them, ride them into town. And yet for every big idea that rose to wild acclaim, there are so many more that never find their fame. And some might seem bizarre to you, and some are only for a few. But many are small businesses that simply lack the tool to find excited people who will stop and say, That's cool. There's an idea for everyone, and you'll love yours. She'll love hers too. These two get served up coffee, cause they adore the brew. If you're the type who needs the crew or likes your ads in vivid hue, behold, it's there. These bikers got some new heads with small businesses and people make connections so profound. And all this personalized and uh, help good ideas get found. So that was a bold effort to defend a world where privacy was not protected, um, at least from the perspective of Tim Cook, and it characterizes the division between Facebook and uh, Apple. But I think this division emphasizes the difference in perspective um, and the different blindnesses between the two of these great technical leaders. Mark Zuckerberg is focused on the good from sharing data, the good from enabling companies to market their content in ways that they can't without these data, while ignoring the bad, the fact that his platform helped drive some of the insanity that we saw explode, for example, on January 6th. And Tim Cook is focused on the bad. He's focused on the hate and the ignorance and the lies and the conspiracies and January 6th. But I fear is he ignoring the good, the way in which this platform can, in fact, enable the spreading of information about products that people might otherwise uh, want. What we need is for both sides to see that we can get the good without the bad, but not in the way that privacy is protected today, not through choice that individuals make about, quote, their data, 
but through systems that effectively and meaningfully and wisely regulate the uses of data and block uses which every rational soul should deem as inconsistent with the values of a free society. Okay, I hope that causes enough trouble to encourage a conversation. Thanks very much. Well, um, Larry, that was uh, spectacular and thought-provoking. And there are many questions that have arisen in the Q&A and the chat. But let me um, start by um, pressing you a little further. You touched on some health data type issues like the, like the father texting um, and essentially what we might call a digital biomarker um, being extracted from that texting pattern um, that uh, is used to identify an early um, dementia, for example. So, and by the way, Larry, if you want to turn your video back on, uh, you can, um, if you can find it. There you go. Nice to see you. Um, so, um, uh, we call, uh, in a paper I published recently, we refer to a broad variety of data types as health relevant data. And the data that's in the health system uh, is pretty regulated under HIPAA but not necessarily regulated in a way that produces the ends we're interested in all the time. Um, and the data outside um, uh, hospitals and what's called covered entities that are regulated under HIPAA are not really regulated uh, with respect to health. So let's take, for example, a very popular data type called social determinants of health these days. It's a huge interest in the health system in measuring these things because Healthcare uh, businesses, including hospitals, um, have realized that the social determinants of health really keep people from being healthy and that can actually cause a lot of expense as well as poor health. So um, bad outcomes for everybody. Measuring the social determinants of health can help us, for example, send, uh, make sure that uh, you get assistance finding housing, make sure that you get assistance uh, adhering to your medications, getting to your appointments, et cetera. At the same time, measuring the social determinants of health could be exactly a predictor that you are not gonna do as well as someone who's got great determinants of health and you're gonna be more expensive, for example, to an insurer. Um, and it's not exactly a pre-existing condition, whether that, gets, uh, whether that remains with us as a protected under the Affordable Care Act or not. So, for this health relevant data that didn't even start as health data, um, but that may uh, drive you out of an insurance policy, for example, um, or out of a health plan, um, what, what would be a policy uh, direction? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, I think the first thing to recognize is that the standard model for dealing with privacy, like choice and, um, um, declaring you own your data doesn't solve that problem at all. Uh, because obviously these are data that are, are gathered or uh, produced in contexts that wouldn't be governed by these choice models. And um, even to the extent they are, it's not clear how the choice models interact. So, so that's, this is part of the reason why I think it's important to start thinking about how to protect uh, on the basis of the way the data is being used. And, I want to first say, I don't think we have full or clear intuitions about what that would be in the wide range of cases, but I think there are a bunch of cases that um, it should be qu pretty clear uh, about. So, so if we think about a principle that says, if you're going to aggregate and use my data, at least you can't be using it against me, using it in ways that make me worse off. Uh, that's a pretty fair baseline, you know, kind of thing that you might we imagine a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, like behind the veil, I'm okay, you gather and use my data as long as I don't suffer from it. Okay, now that in general is gonna be a fair principle, but there are gonna be clear exceptions to that. Again, you know, the, the pedophile who is identified because of the way he interacts on the internet as a child predator, he too might say, hell, you use my data in ways that <laughs> revealed me as a pedophile, I don't like that. And the, and the response to that is, I'm sorry, we, uh, we are going to track down the pedophile and this is, this is the consequence of being a pedophile. And, and so I think that 
Um, it's not going to be simple to say which are the appropriate ways in which I can't be harmed versus which are the appropriate ways in which I can be harmed from this data. But that's the kind of debate that we need to begin to have. Um, and so I think that if we had that debate and tried to draw that line, then there would be context in which um, I think we could uh, you know, imagine it being easier. So take insurance again. From the public data, you determine that I have increasing dementia. I hope I don't. I'm not sort of signaling this because I know something about myself, but it's like an example that I fear. Um, but you know that I have increasing dementia. Um, and uh, the insurance company then wants to say, okay, I'm gonna increase his rates or I'm gonna kick him off. Um, if we lived in a world where there's lots of adequate insurance or the government has a kind of policy in the background, that might not be a problem. If we don't live in that world, then maybe we wanna say you can't use these kind of data in that way. You, you can't act on it. That's not an appropriate use for the insurance company. The insurance company can use these data to begin to model dementia. They can do macro understanding of communities based on like, you know, whether they're law professors or medical school professors and like what the, um, what the aggregate effect is, but I individually shouldn't be punished or burdened by the way in which these data have been used. Now, again, I say this, I frame this whole talk as like first thoughts because I don't, I don't think there's an obvious answer all the way down. And I think at the end point to a lot of these, there's gonna be questions where it's appropriate to say to the user, the, the consumer, like, what do you want? What's your preference about this? But my objective is to wipe away as many of the cases as we can, like wipe away, like make it not something we have to worry about so that we can focus our attention on the hard cases, the cases which really do have conflicting values at their core and people can begin to make meaningful choices or governments make meaningful choices about those without pretending that merely because we've said, you're free to choose one way or the other, everything that people choose then um, uh, immunizes the data user from any further, further question. So just to um, take that one step further. So in the insurance example with let's say social determinants of health, which you gave a very um, articulate answer to, would that be um, a legislative remedy that, that specifically mentioned insurance? So you'd have to really think through who the data users are in that uh, protection model, right? Yeah, exactly right. So, uh, you know, the regime I'm imagining, if you're engaged in the use of data that you've, ex you've accessed publicly or even through users, and you're engaged in the use of that data, then you know, your legal department would evaluate the uses. Like what are the uses that you're making of these data? Um, and some classes of uses would, be, would raise red flags. And they would raise red flags because of legislation that say they raise red flags. So you're an insurance company, you've begun to scan journals, you've discovered that you know, 20 year old uh, um, law review, uh, law professors who write this way and then 40 years later, write in a different way, have a classic sign of dementia. Um, and therefore you respond by withdrawing insurance from law professors like this. Um, that's a red flag. And the legislation or the regulator needs to think about what's the, what's the right balance um, to be able to act on that data um, uh, in that way. Um, but you, know, you use the data in a way that doesn't burden particular individuals. I don't you know, face a cost for participating in the system individually. Then I think that ought to be encouraged because I think the world where we have much more sophisticated understandings of the way data, you know, the, the, that the data could, could fuel would be a much more efficient, just and fair world. And we ought to be aspiring to that rather than, you know, sometimes when I hear Tim Cook and I hear him talk about how terrible it is to aggregate data, I, I, I wanna say, well, well, wait a minute, what if aggregating data makes it so we can control a pandemic? I think that's pretty good aggregation of data. And just because I think that's good doesn't mean I think it's good for Mark Zuckerberg's platform to drive people to storm the Capitol on January 6th. I think that's bad. So I think of these uses differently and we need a system for thinking about the uses differently if we're gonna get the good and eliminate the bad. That's great. So let me go to the Q and A. Um, and I have um, um, a, a very interesting question. What about when the owner of the data is a government entity and not a private corporation? How do the rules apply to them? <laughs> 
I think the the rules are this. Um, well, hmm. there's no simple way to say a general answer to that. Uh, although I, I I'm allergic to the word owner in this context, so I want to say you know, let's not talk about owners. Let's say a government has access to certain data. Um, so for example, the government has access to your tax data. What is the government allowed to do with that data? In deciding whether to prosecute you or not for all sorts of other crimes. I mean, in the general, as things are right now, the government is constrained in how it might use that data, not as much as I think they should, but they are constrained to make it so that when you gather data in one context, it doesn't have radical consequences in another context. And that's the general kind of principle that I think we ought to be applying here, because I think we ought to be thinking about where it's appropriate or fair to allow the gathering in one context to be effective in another context. Um, and that's something that we've developed, begun to develop in the context of the government. And I think, I think we ought to be thinking about that, those same principles in the context of private companies too. So many of us on this Zoom are, are responding to the pandemic with data from the health system, from social media, from patient contributed data. Um, and this secondary use of data from the health system is pressed into, into a surveillance capacity, which even in this context of the pandemic, which you've brought up a few times um, as an example, um, it becomes uh, uh, potentially complex as to whether those data might be used on the one hand, as you talk about globally, to model the pandemic, to understand where we are, where should the vaccine go, as opposed to individually, where it might be to identify individuals who through some, for example, a contact tracing technology combined with other methodologies and then potentially restrict their freedoms under public health authority. Um, can, can, can you just you just muse a bit about these these different ways that data um, might be pressed into service. And by the way, in the pandemic, what the government has done is to um, sometimes compel, but also ask for volunteerism uh, from the health system and providing a whole lot of data about patients for large scale analysis. That's our lifeblood in informatics. Um, mm -hmm. So we tend to favor the acquisition of that data, but we also, are very concerned about the regimes under which it's collected and how it gets protected. Yeah, you know, in some ways, I think the, the current pandemic is an easier case than the general case because there's relatively little stigma <clears throat> associated with the disease. And we can think of other contexts like the, you know, with the rise of AIDS in the early 1980s where there was significant stigma associated with the disease. And so the privacy interests in that context were much more significant, I think, than, um, than I think the privacy context in the, in the, in the era of a flu-like pandemic are. Um, and so in the con my, my view in the flu-like pandemic context is all of these data ought to be accessible for the purpose of mapping and intervening to slow the spread of the disease. And I understand somebody might be upset if uh, police officers show up or I hope not police officers, health officials show up and say, we have reason to believe that you have been exposed and we'd like you to take these steps to minimize further exposure. Um, and I think that the way in which we do that needs to be um, regulated to be extremely you know, human. Like, a, like if you looked at the way Iceland dealt with um, the pandemic, you know, people were isolated into relatively com comfortable facilities. Um, they were given the support necessary to make those uh, make that isolation um, tolerable. Um, I, I think people in Iceland experienced that as appropriate interventions to deal with a deadly disease and the support for the government, which turned its whole decision process over to scientists and doctors, was extremely high because it seemed appropriate. Now, of course, you know, we see these movies of China in China where you know interventions by the government are not as are not Icelandic in that sense, where you know people are grabbed from their houses and forced into facilities, which seem um, brutal in the in their manner. It seems to me that's totally inappropriate. So to say that we are acting on the data is not to say that we can act in any way we want on the data, but I don't think that privacy should block the government's ability 
to stop the slow of a, this, the spread of a deadly pandemic. I think it's one of the most embarrassing examples of privacy because uh, there is no private justification for participating in the spread of, of spread of a pandemic, even if um, you know other diseases don't you know don't uh, don't carry that same conclusion. I just think the character of a pandemic is exactly the context in which we need to find a way and the most uh, find a way as humanely as we can to stop the spread and intervene where we can to block it. And so I think data here should have been massively available and not in there should have been no inhibition from accessing the data. Now, there's extremely important inhibitions and regulations necessary for what you do with the data you've got. So here's where I think the point about punishments is really significant. If you're a you know, research company that's gotten mobile data for the purpose of identifying um, you know, the spread of the pandemic, and then you turn around and use that data for the purpose of marketing to individuals or to setting prices differently on the basis of individuals, there ought to be the death penalty for your corporation, not individually. I don't believe the death penalty individually, but there ought to be a corporate death penalty. There ought to be no, you know, it'd be the maximum penalty so that no executive would think, ah, maybe it makes sense for us to misuse these data. Um, and, and so I, I, I agree that the strongest reaction to a proposal like mine is gonna be driven by the belief that we don't have those, those consequences. We don't have a system of penalties that anybody really cares about. Um, and so the likelihood of these data being misused in the current regime is extremely high. I accept that. So what I'm saying is that we need to worry about regulating misuse and having effective techniques for regulating misuse as a way to enable these more these legitimate uses, which would be so beneficial in lots of contexts, not just in the me medical context. I have a, I have a good question from the Q&A that um, uh, actually uh, follows that up. Um, as an intellectual construct, this is convincing, but how practical is it in terms of actual computing? What percent of use can actually be screened? Yeah. So under existing architecture is very little. And so this is to confess that, you know, we couldn't flip the switch tomorrow and achieve this. But there are all sorts of auditable database architectures which have been developed and promoted as ways to facilitate privacy protective uses of data. And these architectures for these databases would basically make it so that you could know exactly how data was accessed and by whom and for what in, in what context as a way to read back uh, and be able to monitor and police the misuse of these data. And so in the, in the, in the context of thinking about how we move forward with the right policy, what I'm suggesting is rather than continuing down the path of the GDPR, which it seems to me is imposing all sorts of irrational uh, burdens and, and blockages that don't actually help us to achieve what should be the values of privacy, we had to be pivoting and start thinking about how do we build an infrastructure for data that is reliable and uh, we could have confidence in, and we don't have to worry that the data is being misused. Because right now the data is, you know, is being radically misused despite the privacy. I mean, you know, the data aggregators and the people who use data to trace back and to be able to identify particular individuals, especially in the context of politics, is completely the Wild West right now, all this aspiration to protection of privacy notwithstanding. And I don't think it's going to be much different in Europe either. So I, I'm saying this, this is a failed model, the GDPR model, not all of it, but you know, the core intuition around choice. And, um, and we ought to be developing the infrastructure for a more uh, effective model. And that begins with these principles and then worries about the architecture for implementing them uh, s significantly, because I don't think it's trivial. And I, but I do think I have seen instances where um, uh, uh, the architecture is developing in a way to facilitate exactly this kind of use. Great, here's another question from the Q&A. Um, what are the barriers or steps that are needed for policymakers and firms to start adopting consent to specific use of data as opposed to just consent to access to data? And the second part of the question is, how do we standardize the way firms disclose the use of data in a way a layperson can understand? Choice of granting data access is more binary and relatively easy to understand. Yeah, so 
that, that's a hard question, but I feel like I've signaled I don't want to answer that question because I don't think it's meaningful. Um, you know, we can, you know, when you when you read the kind of licenses that lawyers write to define your access to their website or their access to their product, these are complicated tools that are deployed for the purpose of making the lawyers and their employers feel good. They have no effect in producing understanding or meaningful consent. And I don't think this is because they're bad lawyers. I just think it's not a problem that is solvable at the level of individual consent. So I actually don't want to think about how we facilitate meaningful consent by individuals across the wide range of data privacy problems. I think the wide range of data privacy problems needs to be addressed through rules that say categories of uses that are allowed and categories of uses that are not allowed. And then within a narrower range where we can understand there's no clear value or principle or there are conflicting principles that go each way and we, we don't have a clear policy reason to prefer to allow or disallow a certain use. Within a narrow range, then I wanna sit down and spend some time in my own life understanding what the use might be and making a choice about it. Right? So I, I wanna narrow the choices to contact, to a, to, a, to a limited range of contexts so that I have confidence that individuals are actually capable of making the choice. And by saying actually capable, I'm not dissing the capacity of individuals. I'm just saying that humans have a million things demanding their time. And if, you know, the, uh, to imagine they're going to spend enough time to understand privacy policies, given they've got two jobs and they've got three kids and they've got hobbies and they, you know, whatever HBO has put out this week, it's just, it's just not realistic. We ought to understand the capacity that people will have in this context and narrow the, narrow the demands we make on them um, in light of that capacity. Um, and so the general practice here should be removing uh, uh, questions from the domain of privacy, locking certain ones off and, 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 and making clear certain other uses as permitted. And then I'm happy to, within the narrower range, to think about how do we do it in a way that humans can understand? Because we don't do it right now well at all, not at all. Um, you know, Creative Commons was an effort to simplify choices around copyright. You know, the copyright licenses are completely incomprehensible. So we added a kind of layer on top, which we called a, you know, there's a lawyer readable code, there's human readable code, and there's machine readable code. And those three run together. And the human readable code is supposed to be a simple deed that kind of says, says what the permissions are that you're giving and what permissions you're re retaining. But, though, but that is not complicated enough for a license, but it recognizes the different audience and the different you know, uh, potentials for that audience. And, and that's the same thing I think we have to, same intuition we have to bring to the privacy debate and, and, and begin by just saying, the idea that you can be excused for the consequence of your system of data, merely because you've said to the user, are you okay with it? And the user said, yes, is wrong. You're not excused, that's not enough. Um, given we know the user doesn't have a capacity, doesn't have time, doesn't have an understanding of the implications um, for the choices that you're asking them to make. So this the shift of the burden to the individual consumer or patient is some is a cop out in a sense. Yes, exactly. Uh, and potentially an intentional one, uh, yeah. producing a, a, a zero privacy situation. Here's a question. Uh, we'll just have one or two more. Um, here's a question that gets into the medical data specifically. Um, given that genomic data is so personal and revealing, do you think of regulating genomic data differently than, for example, photos and web browsing patterns? Um, I, I don't think of it a, a different principle applying, but I think it's a good context to think about the principle. Um, you know, we're just beginning to see, as you know, more than I, obviously, the potential for genomic data to help us understand disease and, and, and all sorts of potential for humans. And, and given that potential, my view is we ought to be uh, 
uh, enabling uh, access to these data to make that kind of analysis. And the, the quid pro quo for access is no, no penalty for the individual whose data has been uh, enabled. So, you know, um, uh, you can learn from genomic data, certain genes lead to certain predispositions to engage in behavior, which is more costly for insurance companies. Insurance companies shouldn't be allowed to punish me on the basis of my, de uh, of my DNA for that, for having learned that. Um, so, you know, insurance companies might say, well, geez, we're going to have to pay a whole, you know, a lot more than we otherwise would be able to pay, uh, would have to pay if we could learn this data. And the answer is, yeah, that's right. But, you know, insurance, the trade-off between perfectly efficient insurancing, insurance pricing and fair encouragement of participating in the gathering and use of these data, you know, tilts against the insurance company in favors of the, the individual. So I think that principle um, is, you know, is a clear example of the kind of regime I'm talking about. The data can be used, you can learn whatever you want from it, but the individual is not going to be punished for the consequence of those data. The harder cases are cases where there's, you know, predisposition to engage in certain behaviors, and those behaviors themselves have consequences, you know, because, you know, not, not all behaviors are easily controlled by the individual. Um, so, you know, if, if there is, I'm not claiming there is, but if there is a predisposition to alcohol, to addiction, like alcohol addiction, um, it's not that it's easy then to, to do something with that, but, but it might be that because there is something you can do with that, there ought to be a better mechanism for facilitating responsibility by that individual. Now, I'm not sure what that looks like, and I don't, I don't want to say that it's an easy problem, but that's the kind of analysis that I would want to raise uh, in that context rather than you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of 23andMe. I, I have no idea what I've sold or given away when I sign that thing uh, saying, you know, use my data. Um, I, I just want a stronger confidence that I'm not going to be, there's not going to be a penalty for my doing that in a way that, um, um, you know, uh, is produced by the data that I have made available. So you probably saw the 23andMe question in the, in the window. Uh, maybe, or, or maybe you just it. happened to, because that's the most recent question. And so let me ask that question in this context. Um, first, I'll give the, the context, the larger context of the question, I think, and then I'll ask the question specifically. And that is, what happens when you give data to a company um, that then either changes their policies or gets sold to another uh, company? Um, and the specific question, which I think is a very good one, apparently 23andMe is going public what will happen with the data that were obtained under um, a promise not to share with a third party? Yeah. So, you know, all, all of these promises are inside of agreements that give the company the right to change the terms in the future, at least with sufficient notice um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the party. And this is a classic example of why I think there's a real problem with allowing these to be regulated by, um, by these uh, private contracts alone. Because uh, you know, the fact that you are, have a, a resource which um, you know, is enormously valuable if stripped of its privacy restrictions creates an incredible incentive for acquirers to come in and pay off founders and then strip the privacy protectors. Now, the law steps in, in, in some ways, not adequately, I think, but I think in some ways to restrict the capacity to do that. Um, uh, and so some of these agreements become like property agreements and not um, reformable. Um, but, but I think that the, um, if there were a stronger legislative overhang here that said um, uh, uh, you know, that, that any changes you make are not going to be able, not, not going to be allowed to empower you to reach back and effectively punish the provider, um, then that would restrict the scope for modification in a way that protects the underlying value that I'm trying to identify. Um, and so I, I would like, that's why I think legislative override, override or overhang here is, um, is really important. And I would, I, I would say 23andMe is a great example of why we're gonna see it's gonna be necessary. That's great. So on that uh, question, we'll make it um, the last uh, question for today. People can get on with their evenings. Um, 
Larry, this was um, fantastic. Um, you engaged with this audience. Um, we didn't get to ask even half the questions uh, that appeared uh, in the chat and the Q&A. Um, I'm sure uh, people will want to follow up in various ways. Um, there was a question about whether uh, the recording would be available and it'll be on the chip.org website. I put that in the chat window within a few days, um, along with recordings from some of the other landmark ideas talks. Um, and um, we have upcoming talks from uh, uh, Michael Creamer, um, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics um, uh, in part for his work on randomized controlled trials, something very relevant in healthcare um, as well, even though that's not his domain. Uh, Chrissy Farr, who is the um, uh, former CNBC health uh, and health tech reporter, um, who's now moved into the venture capital world and has an incredible bird's eye view of the entire um, health IT uh, landscape. And uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you at our future um, uh, meetings. And I hope everyone has a terrific uh, rest of the afternoon and evening. And thank you again, Larry. Terrific. Thank thanks, thanks so much for everybody's uh, questions.